Hello, students, and welcome to Math 45, Chapter 5, um, page 37. I'm your instructor, Cindy Enrique, and we're going to be going over section 5.7, which is inverses and radical functions. All right, so we want to know whether or not um, two functions are inverses of each other. So what we know is that you can do a composition of functions. So g composed with f of x is the same as f composed with g of x. So this is actually called the composition of functions. We've done this before. Okay, so we have our fun composition of functions. So for the first example, it says show that f of x and f inverse are inverses. Um, for x not equal to 0 and negative 1. And the reason they say for x not equal to 0 or negative 1, because that would give a denominator division by 0. So just notice here that the denominator, we do not want it equal to 0, because if we have division by 0, it's undefined. So notice 1 over x, that's division by 0. If I have negative 1 plus 1, that's 0, and that's not good either. So just note that that's just for our denominator not being equal to 0. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, show that these are inverses of each other. So we are going to show that f composed with, let's say, our f inverse of x is going to equal to x. That is our goal, to show that they are inverses. Okay, so here we go. We are going to go ahead and do this problem. So I have f, and I'm going to compose it with my f inverse of x. So what does this look like? So I have my function f. So my function f looks like this. It's 1 over x plus 1. So I know that I'm going to have 1 over, here's my x value, plus 1. So what I'm going to be plugging in is going to be my f inverse. So my f inverse is 1 over x minus 1. So that is actually what my x inverse is like. So now I'm going to simplify this. So I have 1 over 1 over x minus 1 plus 1. So I know that the negative 1 and the positive 1 can cancel. So now I'm going to have 1 over, I'm going to have 1 over x. Since the negative 1 and the positive 1 ends up canceling out. So this is just a division. This is really saying that 1 is being divided by 1 over x. So this is really saying 1 times x over 1, which is just really just x. So I have just shown that f composed with f inverse is equal to x. So I have just shown that f composed with f inverse of x is equal to x. So therefore, they are inverses of each other. Okay, so they are inverses of each other. Perfect. Okay, so now um, down below we have some steps of how to find our inverses. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to replace f of x with y, we're going to swap x and y, we're going to solve for y, and we're going to replace y with f inverse of x. So here we go, we're just going to go, we're just going to follow along step by step. So we have the function f of x is equal to 5x cubed plus 1. 
so we know that we have f of x is equal to 5x cubed plus 1. So step number one, it says replace f of x with y. So, okay, so we're switching. So this is really y is equal to 5x cubed plus 1. Step number two says, hey, now we're going to switch the x and the y. So, okay, so this is x is equal to 5y to the third plus 1. I just switched it. Now it says to solve for y. So my goal here is to get the y isolated. So I'm going to subtract 1 on both sides. So subtract 1, subtract 1. So I can get that x minus 1 is equal to 5y cubed. From here, what I can do is divide by 5 on each side. So divide by 5, divide by 5. So I can get that x minus 1 divided by 5 is equal to y cubed. Now, because it's a degree 3, y to the third power, I'm going to raise it. I'm going to raise it to the one-third power to get rid of it, to the one-third power. So whatever I do to one side, I do the next side. So this is going to get me x minus 1 over 5 to the one-third power is equal to just y. And really, I can just switch that. It's y is equal to x minus 1 over 5 to the one-third power. And that last step says, hey, replace y with f inverse of x. So, okay, so f inverse of x is equal to x minus 1 over 5 to the one-third power. And so that ends up becoming my final answer. Okay, I hope that helps. Now it says we have restricting the domain. If a function is not a one-to-one, -one, it cannot have an inverse. If we restrict the domain of the function so that it becomes a one-to-one, -one, thus creating a new function, this function will have an inverse. So find the inverse of f of x, x minus 4 squared, for x greater than or equal to 4. What is the domain of the inverse? So, okay. Well, um, right now, I can go ahead and find the domain and range of my original function. So I have that f of x is equal to x minus 4 squared, okay? And this is for all of my values for x greater than or equal to 4. So, okay, that's going to tell us a couple of things. I know what my domain is going to be. My domain, well, it tells me my x value is greater than or equal to 4. So the smallest value it can be is 4, and it can go off to positive infinity. So the domain comes strictly from what was given, that x greater than or equal to 4. So now my range is going to come from what I actually plug into my equation. So my range is a little bit more work, but that's okay. So since the smallest value that I can plug in is 4, so I know that x equals to 4 is the smallest value. So if I have 4 minus 4 squared, that's going to give me 0. So then I know that my range is going to be 0, and it's going to go off to positive infinity. Okay. So what I really did is I let x equal to a positive 4. So I plug x equals to 4 into f of x. to get my minimum range value. Okay, so that is what I actually did. And so this is just kind of gives me my background information. So now what I want to do is I want to find the inverse of this function. So okay, so now I'm thinking about the inverse. 
So I know I'm going to have some work that I'm going to have to do, and that's okay. So I know that I started off with f of x is equal to x minus 4 squared. So really, I have y is equal to x minus 4 squared. So then from here, I'm going to switch my x and my y's. So x is equal to y minus 4 squared. So to undo that, squ that square that I have, I can do that by square rooting it. And I can't forget that plus or minus. So this is plus or minus the square root of x is equal to y minus 4. And since it's subtract of 4, then I know that I can add 4. So now this gives me positive 4 plus or minus the square root of x is equal to y. Now if I want to rearrange that, that would be y is equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of x. To change it back into my inverse notation, I would just say that this is f inverse of x is equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of x. But now it specifically wants us to write the, um, the domain and range of the inverse. So, okay, so we are going to have my domain and the range. So what we're actually going to do is we are going to actually flip it. So notice that for f of x, I had my domain. The domain went from 4 to positive infinity. And my range went from 0 to positive infinity. Well, what ends up happening for my inverse is that it actually ends up switching. So I'm going to get that my domain was my range value from my original. So it's going to go from 0 to infinity. So that means my range is going to go between 4 to infinity. So the domain and range actually flip. So do my domain here goes from Sorry guys. So my domain is going to go from 0 to positive infinity. And my range is going to go from 4 to positive infinity. So that is my domain and range of the inverse function. Okay. So for the next example, it says find the inverse of my f of x. So, okay, it's very, very similar to the first inverse that we did. So, and it also wants us to find the domain of the inverse. So, okay, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and I am going to write out my function. So, I have my function f of x, which is equal to an x minus 2 squared minus 3. And my restriction is that x is less than or equal to 2. So I know by looking at this what my domain and range is going to be of my original function. So for f of x, I'm going to have my domain. My domain, well, it says that it's less than or equal to 2. So if it's less than or equal to 2, that means the smallest value is negative infinity. And my biggest value is positive 2. And if you need that visual, less than or equal to 2 looks like that. So I have negative infinity over here. Okay, So that's from just given that x is less than or equal to 2. So my range is going to come from plugging in positive 2 into my function. So if I have my x 
minus 2 squared minus 3. I'm going to plug in x is equal to my positive 2. Plug that in. So I'm going to have 2 minus 2 squared minus 3. So 0 minus 3 gives me negative 3. So my range, the smallest value that I'm going to get is negative 3. And it goes off to positive infinity. So then that tells me that for my f inverse, I already know what the domain is going to be. So f inverse of x. Well, I know that it gets switched. So my domain is going to go between negative 3 to positive infinity. And I know that my range is going to go from negative infinity to positive 2. And it actually wants me to find the inverse. So, okay, so I found the domain and range of the inverse function, and I also have to find the actual inverse. So I have that y is equal to x minus 2 squared minus 3. So I'm going to switch it. Now it's x is equal to y minus 2 squared minus 3. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides. So when I add 3, I'm going to have x plus 3 is equal to y minus 2 squared. To undo the square, I have to square root it. So plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 is equal to y minus 2. Now I'm going to add 2 to both sides. So 2 plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 is equal to y. Now I'm going to flip this around. So then y is equal to 2 plus or minus the square root of x plus 3. And remember to rewrite it in the proper notation so that f inverse of x is equal to 2 plus or minus the square root of x plus 3. So now I have my inverse as well. Okay. Well, the next example is the same thing. We're just finding the inverse and finding the domain of the inverse. And that's, that's okay. You're going to have a lot of work to do that or a lot of homework problems to practice that. I'd rather get into this word problem. So it says, a mound of gravel is in the shape of a cone with a height equal to twice the radius. The volume of the cone in terms of the radius is given by this equation. Find the inverse of the function if the function that determines the volume v of a cone and is a function of the radius r. Then use the inverse to calculate the radius of such a mound of gravel measuring 100 cubic feet. Use pi as 3.14. So you're just like, okay, like what the heck am I supposed to be doing? It says find the inverse of the function that determines the value v of a cone and is a function of the radius r. So this function of radius r tells us what to isolate for. So we want to isolate for the r variable. So you're like, okay, so I know what I originally have. I have my original that my volume is equal to 2 thirds pi r cubed. So your goal is to get the r by itself. So what you want to do is you want to get rid of that 2 thirds. To get rid of that 2 thirds, you can do that by multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's 3 halves. So I'm multiplying by the reciprocal, so now I have 3 halves v is equal to, and so this fraction cancels, 
and I have my pi times my r cubed. Well, to get the r by itself, that means I'm going to divide by pi, so divide by pi, divide by pi, so I end up getting 3v over 2 pi is equal to r cubed. And to get the r by itself, that means I'm going to raise everything to the one-third power. And so that gives me that 3v over 2 pi to the one-third power is equal to r. And so if I just kind of switch the order around, I have r is equal to 3v over 2 pi to the one-third power power. And so I'm just going to rewrite it over here. So I have r is equal to 3v all over 2 pi to the 1 third power. So that is the inverse that I have found. So I have found the inverse. Okay. Now, it specifically says, then use the inverse to calculate the radius of such a mound of gravel measuring 100 cubic feet. Use pi as 3.14. So you're just like, okay, so that means that 100 cubic feet, that comes from the volume. So what we have is we have that the volume is equal to 100 cubic feet, and it's also using us to use, it's also telling us that pi is equal to 3.14. So this is what we're going to be plugging into our equation. So r is equal to 3. That v value that I'm plugging in is 100. 2 times my pi value and that pi value that I'm plugging in is 3.14, and this is all to the one third power. So if I have all that and I plug it into my calculator, I'm gonna get my value of r. And it says, um, I'm gonna go ahead and round to the two decimal places. So I'm gonna have 3.63. So I'm gonna have 3.63 feet as my final answer. Okay. Well, I hope that makes sense. If not, you guys know that you guys can email me or go to the Mass Success Center. They have online tutoring as well as, um, as, well as a lot of extra help with tutors. All right. So it says find the domain of the function. So notice how this is a square root function. So we want the inside to be greater than or equal to zero. So square root function. And so we have to be careful. So we want the inside to be greater than or equal to zero. Because if it was, let's say, negative, the square root of negative one, that would be an imaginary number. So we do not want it to be imaginary, okay? We want the inside to be positive. So we're gonna have to do that um, interval stuff for finding our boundary points. So, okay, so here we go. We're gonna find boundary points. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to graph the boundary points on the number line. The third we're going to the third thing we're going to do is we're going to test the value. 
And don't forget to write your final answer in interval notation. Okay, so here we go. We are going to start by setting, by finding our boundary points. And don't forget that finding our boundary points, there's two steps, right? We're going to set the numerator equal to zero, and we're also going to be setting our denominator equal to zero as well. That is how we found our boundary points. So, okay, let's work with the numerator first. So for our numerator, we have this x plus 2 and the x minus 3. We're setting it equal to 0. So that tells us that x plus 2 is equal to 0. So x is equal to negative 2. x minus 3 is equal to 0. So x is equal to positive 3. So we have our two boundary points. We have x is equal to negative 2 and x is equal to positive 3. Now I'm going to be looking at the denominator. So if I'm looking at the denominator, we have the x minus 1 equal to 0. So x is equal to positive 1. So that is our other boundary points. So I'm going to go ahead and remember, since it's a denominator, this is where it would be undefined. So I'm going to go ahead and graph this on my number line. So I know that I have a negative 2, I have a positive 1, and I have a positive 3. And don't forget that at positive 1, it's undefined because that was my denominator. So I'm just going to put an x there so I know that I can't include it, okay? It, was, it would have to be a parenthesis here. So now I'm going to test the values to determine whether these intervals are positive or negative. So I don't know. Let's pick something that lives over here. Let's try x is equal to negative 3. So if I'm going to try f of negative 3. So f of negative 3. And all I care about is whether or not it's going to be positive or negative. And when I plug it back into my original equation, so that's my original equation up in there, so when I plug it into my original equation, I get a negative number, okay? So I get something that's negative. So now I'm going to try something over here. So, I don't know, maybe my x is equal to 0 would be a good number to plug in. So if I plug in x is equal to 0 and plug it into my equation, I actually end up getting a positive number. And over here, let's say I have x is equal to a positive 2. So I plug 2 into my original equation, and I end up getting a negative number. And over here, uh, let's say I try x is equal to 4. I plug that into my original equation, and I end up getting something that's positive. So remember, if I want this to be greater than or equal to 0, that's telling me that I'm looking at positive intervals. So the only thing I'm really interested in is everything that has a plus to it. So that has a plus, and this has a plus. So now I can write my answer in interval notation. So I'm going to go from negative 2 to positive 1. Remember, at positive 1, that's where it's undefined, so I need to have a parenthesis there. And then it goes from positive 3 all the way off to positive infinity. Okay. And that is the end of section 5.7. I hope that helps.